Transportation was a problem in the early days, and it had to come with uh, by stagecoach. The trains had come into uh, Bryant Pond by 1850, and uh, the Tuttle stagecoach line operated between. Uh, came one branch into Andover and one toward the Rumford and di under, into Dixfield. Yeah. Then later on, uh, there were, well, it was an attempt uh, about the turn of the century to bring uh, the Grand Trunk Railroad which was the Portland, it had originally been the Atlantic and St. Lawrence, but it had been changed to Grand Trunk Railroad to bring the spur into Rumford and into Andover. In fact, that was surveyed out, and this was promoted by Waldo Pettengill. Waldo Pettengill had been associated closely with Chisholm, but here, here they, they were apart on an issue. Chisholm opposed it, and uh, Pettengill uh, was for it because he, he was more familiar with the people in the Hanover and the Andover area, see. And the, the actual survey took place it crossed the Androscoggin River near the, uh, the Hanover-Rumford-Hanover town line. Uh, and they had a three-day meeting. They called it the Railroad Commission's meeting in, uh, in the wigwam in Rumford. And, and Chisholm won. They failed to, uh, to grant the request. Well, it went along until 19, uh, 1907, and then a uh, man named the Elliot Howe and Silvio Garnier devised a scheme of uh, building an electric railroad from Rumford into Bethel. And they got a charter for that one. That was about the time that uh, that the, uh, the electric railroads were becoming quite popular. In fact, every K Day who would come here and uh, establish the E K Day Company, that that had been his uh, job and of uh, setting up railroads. He he'd just set one up between Augusta and Holland before he came here. Well, the survey for that one went come up, followed the river up Rumford Center, went up the end of a road to what we call Whipwell, down Whipwell, and then back to the river. And, and nobody really knows just why they made that loop, whether to get near a Andover or whether to avoid the, the, the hill, the grade down by uh, between Rumford Point and Rumford Center. Anyway, uh, the, it, it's right, it, uh, it failed. The, the charter was granted, but they never raised the money. And probably it was because, really, the automobile was being, by 1912 or 15, the automobile was coming into prominence and uh, nobody wanted to. Uh, nobody wanted to, f to fool with it. Uh, Stagecoach had had several different uh, types. There, there was one when they didn't have too much of a load. There was a three-horse stagecoach line, but the Tuttle brothers had two genuine Concord coaches. And one of them burned when the uh, the barn uh, the buildings burned in in uh, Rumford Corner, which was called Rumford at that time. But this this here is a, taken from a book uh, of the Concord coaches. And this, this was the coach that ran between here, Bryant Pond and Andover. The, uh, here we have a, a, a picture of an, of an automobile that was made here in Rumford made by Tom French of Andover. 
and uh, it was uh, a product of the United States Motor Carriage Company, organized the syndicate of the organization in 1899. What did they it had no name. It had no it's name. the only one ever built, as far as we can know. No. Um, then it became the French Auto Company, the they did 19, company in 99. Uh, I guess it, it didn't prosper, but uh, no one really knows whatever became of the automobile. By 1905, though, uh, the F Fords were coming out, and one of the great Automobile dealers of Rumford was uh, John Stevens. He he sold Fords for a while. He sold uh, he made records and selling the old Maxwells. But here's one of his ads. Here's a picture of uh, John Stevens, and here's he here was his 1905 ad, Rumford Falls Times, for making. Uh, the automobiles. Well, we get along into, uh, of course, the automobile could only be used, say, from May through to November because the roads weren't broken. They used rollers at that time to roll the snow. And finally, after the rollers went by, they used to break with three horse teams with a sort of a grader that they would use in the summertime for grading the roads. And then, of course, the, the, uh, the railroads changed everything. It put the, a, uh, it put the people out of business that, that run in the stage lines, but there were hospitals. Well, I guess you'd call them horse taxes in those days. Horse teams for hire or sh chauffeurs for hire. And he here is a case of uh, Elton Knight had a team for hire and, and going, he, he met Mr. and Mrs. Marble at, at the train in, in uh, Wild Pond on the way, on their return home. You'll notice that he wore a stovepipe hat, and he had a he, he had a pail to to water his horse when he came to the brook. Okay. One of the most interesting type when you talk about slow motion, this was a uh, this was Abe Merrill who had a an ox that he harnessed up into a sleigh or a wagon to come from his East Bethel home down to Rumford Corner to do his shopping. Means of transportation. That's yeah. right. He could do about two miles an hour. Oh. The the trains, though, as they went, became uh, opened up the country to uh, uh, sportsmen and so forth. And here's a, here is a case here where, in 1892, somebody took this photograph of. A dozen trout caught on the off off the wharf at Bemis. Looked like good trout to me. Are. Schools were terribly important to the early settlers. In fact, uh, they were kids were schooled in their own homes to a certain extent. Then, in a few years, they formed districts. And uh, they raised their own money for their own schools and built their own school buildings. And that went on for years and years and years. There were 13 districts here at one time in Rumford. In Rumford. Well, they had to be uh, set up in districts because, trans because of lack of transportation. You know, the kids walked to school and they couldn't walk 10 miles. They, they could make them walk two or three miles. But uh, one of the uh, early school buildings as a town building was at East Rumford. And luckily, we have a, a, a photograph of that. 
in the drum. That would remain there as sort of a tool shed of a storage house until, well, maybe 20, 20 25 years ago. Very close to the present. Uh, That's, right. That's right. That's uh, right. Uh, the first free, well, if, if I speak of free high schools, the first free high school was established in 1894. And it was, uh, the first principal was a man by the name of George Stearns who went, left here with uh, Garrett Skink when he formed the Great Northern Paper Company and, and great, uh, George Stearns became the land agent for the Great Northern Paper Company. And the school in Millinocket was named for him, Stearns High School. Yeah. So uh, he was the first, first principal of the f high, free high school. Well, there were times in the schools that uh, certain kids went to school at certain times of the year, and at other times they were they mingled. Uh, you have a photograph here of uh, one of those such times at the. Uh, it's not here. At the Chisholm School, uh, this okay. there's one right there. Uh, you, a certain se section of the school is set off for high school kids, and the, and the other one, the the uh, grammar school kids. But there were school hills kids all over the place. Now here's one in 1898 of Burgess Hill. High school, the, the man with the name of uh, Ann, Andrew Churchill was the school teacher, shown there. He was the father of Frank Churchill, who we'll talk about later, but he, uh, I think after, either after or before that, he was employed by what was known as the Fort Hill Chem Chemical Company in Rumford. He'd come here from Pennsylvania, but he was a prudent native. Uh, here, here's one of the Chisholm School with more kids in that 1900. That's when everyone was going there. And but the Chisholm School was the first high school. That's right. That was the first high school. And now here, here is the graduating class of 1902. Certainly dominated by women. Yeah, and they, but you, you notice the dress code there. Now, there are some names we couldn't identify there. There was a, uh, the, in, uh, in the middle row of back was a man named Charles Taylor, who some people could remember. And on the left up here is Alton Austin. Now, about that same, that's 1902 at Rumford Point, there was a Rumford High School, uh, Rumford Point High School. And here, here was a case where only uh, they only went to school in the winter time. The other kids went to school in the spring and the fall, primary and elementary kids, but winter was reserved for the high school. So that uh, that this this Rumford Fall this Rumford Point High School went on for a number of years. Uh, and then there was a, the, the McDonald School was built. And then in Mexico, the Mexico High School can be affiliated with Abbott School. At, at, uh, and here is, here is the, the uh, first Stevens High School building. A lot of people will remember that. At uh, Virginia, I don't know how many, take, take a count there, but the wow. about eight grades were going at the Virginia school at that time. And at Rumford Center, the original school was built up by where the Foster home is now, <coughs> and then 1898, the, the present 
building there that's used as the uh, historical museum, Lufkin School Museum is there. Uh, here's Rumford Point High School, Rumford Point School with high school kids in 1921. Difference. They put the porch on this time. That's right. And here is the Kimball School in Mexico. That building is still exists. That's Dr. Martin's uh, clinic there. Right. Uh, very early when when uh, the, the the first minister. That's strange. It can, the name just slips me now. But he he wanted to build a, an academy here. Reverend Gould, Gould. Uh, Reverend Gould wanted to build an academy here. Well, about around 18. Well, shortly after he came here from Bethel, probably in the early 1820s, uh, he was a great educator. But he could get no interest to build that academy. He eventually left his estate to build it in Bethel. Uh, but there was great interest here. There were many people went on to different schools, Kent's Hill and Hebron Gould Academy. That's where they went for further education that they could get out of the, the, well, the uh, early uh, district schools. Music was a great thing in Rumford. All through the years, the first real musician, uh, Jose Ripley, Born on Ellis River, the Ellis River farm of parents. Uh, went to Bethel, went off to the Civil War, uh, and uh, wrote manuscripts that are in the Lincoln Center in New York City now, marches. Ripley, they said, could, uh, he never took a music lesson in his life, and it, it, there was never a musical instrument that he couldn't play. He was a bandmaster. And then, of course, very few people are aware of the fact, I think, that uh, one of the uh, Walt Disney crew was born in, in Mexico, called Ridlandville, Frank Churchill. Uh, I think it was 19, uh, around 1900, he was born there. And uh, the family moved to California. He attended college out there. He went to, uh, I forget the name of the college right now. Uh, he, he was a great musician. For a while, he played piano in the silent movie shops. And then he caught on with Walt Disney and his productions, and uh, <coughs> he wrote all of Disney's early music. Now here's one here, you know, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. You'll see the name Frank Churchill there. Frank Churchill is a product of Mexico. His father was uh, the school teacher on Burgess Hill. I was wondering if you were yeah, the same family. That same family. And of course, then we come to Walter Rolfe, who was born here on, the, on his father's farm, just down below what is Rumford Corner. <coughs> he was a composer, <coughs> published Walter Ralph Music Company, and uh, uh, he wrote over, I believe they claim 600 compositions. And we go down through the years, in, and you get into the 1906-1907 uh, era was a, the Rumford Band Association <coughs> hired a director, the name of Charles Thiel, <coughs> and he, he and his wife were great musicians, and they formed the boys' band and the girls' band here. And they were self-sustaining, so they played and uh, got money enough to buy their uniforms and their instruments. And they went on down to Florida to live after a few years in the, the, um, 
the junior band sort of folded up. <coughs> the only other was the Strathglass Pipe Band, which was pretty popular around here. Bag yeah, it's the bagpipes. And uh, most of those people can be identified, but it's interesting to note that the youngest one in the front is <coughs> Bill Chisholm. Well, he certainly has a few legs. Yes, and along came <coughs> later, Harry Cohen became the bandmaster in Rumford. And they had, in that, by 1936, he had a, had organized a band. And uh, as you see, Harry Cohen on the left. So music was a big part of uh, Rumford's history. Churches were a big part because the early church was a was a discipl disciplinarian of the population. It was a dishonor to be ever kicked out of the church, and if you violated a, a law, you you have went before the elders and you were removed from the church. Your name was taken from the roster, and that, to to many, was as as bad as a uh, you know a, a uh, sentence in jail. Here is the building where the, the first church services were held, and they were held there for more than 50 years. The old meeting, they called it the Meeting House. That was dedicated in 18, I think it was 1829, but there was some sort of a building there as early as 1804 where people met for worship and conduct a town business. It was, and the meetings were held there until the churches were built in other spots. Yeah. Here's a, in around 18, late 1840s, the Universalist Church was built at Rumford Point. Uh, this originally had a steeple on it. That shows the belfry. The belfry came off later. Uh, And after the Congregational Church was built, it, 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 it sort of faded down. It would became, uh, well, sort of an eyesore and was eventually taken down and destroyed. But this was a picture, of the, one of the last pictures that taken. The belfry was gone, but some people will remember it right. by that picture there. Now, this, here is a, of the Rumford Point Congregational Church in the 1860s and that as it was then and as it looks today. Right. And we get into the Rumford proper and we have a, a series of photos of, of the churches. Here is an original of the Methodist Church and here is an original of the Universalist Church. original of the, of the Baptist Church. And then the St. Athanasius Church. A lot of people don't realize that the first Catholic services, when the mills were built, mill was built, was the first services were held in the mill itself, in one of the rooms. That's right, Father Haran. This was a building that uh, Timothy Walker built and gave to the village, Rumford Corner, hired a minister for a year, and eventually failed and was torn down. It no longer exists. In the military, uh, the militia, of course, was the first military organization. And the, the, uh, every, every young man had to join uh, the militia at a certain age. And they had their musters once a year, their practices, sometimes oftener. And, uh, and eventually, uh, it eventually grew into the uh, National Guard and, of course, the, the United States Army. Uh, very few, 
the, the, the Revolutionary War settlers here, but no, there was no one here that went to Revolutionary War because the town hadn't been populated at that time. Uh, so the first real test was the War of 1812. And there were a few that went here. One of them was a man named Daniel Carr who lived I don't know if we call the Albert Abbott farm where the airport is now. Daniel Carr lost an arm in that war, and uh, he, he received a pension of $12 a month for his disability the rest of his life. So that was, then we come to the Civil War, and that was, that was the draining effect on uh, the whole economy of Rumford. They claim there were more, population-wise, there were more went more young men went in the Civil War than probably any other community in the state. Their fathers and sons, and some of them, there were two, was a father and son with the name of Eaton that both were killed in the Civil War. Fathers sought beside their sons. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the most of the men from this area were in the 12th Maine Regiment, and the 12th Maine uh, had a, an immense collection of battle flags that had been captured. Uh, and after the war, they, they formed the Grand Army of the Republic, of course, the GAR. And they had, they built a building at Rumford Center. And then they had the, the sons of the veterans, so forth. And they, they used to have their meetings. And there's the, there's a building. That, it burned in 1921, I believe it was, and all of the uh, all of the relics were lost, went up in the fire. The uh, the town tried to, the townspeople wanted to erect a monument to the Civil War veterans, and time and time again the town voted it down. And it was only because that this building burned and they collected the insurance. And then the, the four veterans that were the left deeded the, the land to the Grange to expand their facility that the, uh, the Civil War Monument exists today. Those four veterans saw the chance to finally get a monument for all Civil War veterans, which, of course, is there yeah, in Rufford Center today. This is a uh, photograph here, yeah, and there's another one of it. The insurance, the insurance and the sale of the land brought in mo money enough with what they could get from contributions to, s to establish this monument. And, of course, one of the World War uh, one came along, um, it's a bad or a modern history. It, it's just quite unknown how, just how many men, if you haven't had an actual count, uh, there's, a, there's a photograph of the, of the three last remaining Civil War veterans. That was taken at the day the uh, Veterans Monument was uh, was christened or uh, dedicated. It's, now we're getting into the World War One. Fathers and sons again went to, to war. Here is Dr. Albert Stanwood, Stanwood with his son, Dr. Harold Stanwood, and his two and his two sons, uh, two sons, Joe and Seth in uh, military uniform. Uh, an interesting aspect of World War I, the lumber union that went to Scotland, they, they were recruited by uh, the military to go to Scotland to cut lumber, to uh, use in the bunkers in the trenches of France. And they were mostly lumbermen. Uh, 
Charlie Hopkins was one of them from around here. And this was in 1917. The, the, uh, there's a, a picture of them in, in Scotland. They stayed for a year and then were, the contract was terminated. But many of them uh, came back and then enlisted in the armed forces. But some of them enlisted in the armed forces while they were over there. And Charlie was, Hopkins was the first one, supposedly the first one, uh, to enter military service while living in a foreign country. The villages were sprung up. And here, here are the two first villages, the first two villages, uh, as they appear later in, it, later in history, later, Rumford Point in the foreground, Rumford Corner in the background. This was probably taken just before 1900, but th th these were the first villages that sprung up. Uh, here is an early village picture of Rumford Point showing the, the, the common, they used to have baseball games out there. And looking another way here, here is another one. Uh, showing the other direction. Now, all, all of the villages, well, by the 1900s and the late 1890s were lined with elm trees because people had uh, seen the grace and the glory of the elm tree and had set them out generations before. And this was how they looked. This is a Rumford Point uh, scene, but it's typical of all over the, uh, all over the state of Maine, especially uh, Rumford villages too. Here, here is a uh, village scene at Rumford Center a certain time. Showing, uh, I believe it shows uh, it was before the corn shop was built. And some of the buildings, are, of course, have gone before now. Here's another one of Rumford Corner, an early scene. It's very difficult to get, find these uh, early village scenes. Here is Rumford Center on a colored postcard which shows on the extreme left the corn shop. Oh, yeah. And here is a taken. Here is a photograph that will will dis explain just how Rumford Point got its name. Here's the point on the river from the top of the mountain, showing Hanover in the background. The taverns and the hotels were uh, very prominent in those days. Uh, The the, uh, the the wheeler and the bolster ones at uh, East Rumford were prominent. Here here is a uh, a, dedic a little program titled Dedication J H Farnham's Hall. Now this was probably the first public hall in the town of Rumford. It's dated in 1853. It later became known as American Hotel, and it burned in uh, in the 90s. But it was the the head social place. The uh, early telegraph office was there, and at one time the the Masons held their meetings there. Uh, Rumford Corner. It, they called it, that was Rumford at that time. That, and then along came the, excuse me here, along came the other ones. Now here is the, 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 uh, the street scene on Congress Street in Rumford. We use this to show the, the building of how early it was, a Hotel Rumford that later burned. Here's the building on the left. 
here is the building it has, a, it has appeared in the, the earliest part of the town after being completed and probably about 10 or 15 years before it burned. It, here was the Falls View Hotel. That's, that's right. And when that burned, uh, the Malalas family practically perished there. Uh, here is a uh, old scene and a new one. This was the Kimball Tavern. Moses Kimball and later by Asa Kimball and even Roscoe Knight in the later years ran a tavern and a hotel there. The old barn and this this is a sort of a that are now picture there. It shows them together. So, and then we had the shops and the mills. And one of the uh, early ones was the corn shop, which was located between this house and where you live. Right. And here's a picture of it. They, about 1881, they started the HF Webb Company because it had corn there, and that picture shows uh, small children used in the process. Everything was hand done. I imagine that the children probably would did the husking. The women cut it off the cob with the knives, and then the cans were hand soldered. And uh, we have letters here. I've seen letters where uh, some canning company offered the canner four and a half cents a can for his product. That was a 20 ounce can. Uh, there's a letter here that uh, establishes that fact. Uh, the, at uh, what they call Littlefield was where the, well, there's a post office called Littlefield there where the Hoyt family lived, where the branch of the road goes up to the uh, Red Hill Road. Uh, was a shook factory. Now shook was shook, making staves for barrels. See, uh, and uh, the Scribners moved in uh, back of the center and had a mill up in back of the village for years, uh, dowels and so forth, at the foot of uh, Split Brook, right where the uh, end of a road breaks off from Route 2. There was a mill there for many years, and uh, people by the name of Vaughn Staples made oars there. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the coming of the big thing, when the, the town was becoming industrialized, uh, Waldo Pettengill set up the Dunton Lumber Company. There was a great demand for lumber. Uh, Blanchard and Twitchell was located down where the, the FX Park is now. Couldn't provide the, uh, and they didn't have the, the equipment. Couldn't provide enough lumber. So Pettengill sought out a man by the name of Hollis Dunton and that came here to come here and establish this uh, mill. He brought in a man by the name of Derry to handle the, the business management. And this mill, grew and prospered all through the years, and at times had as many as 60 people working there. This is looking across. It's difficult to find a photograph, a good photograph of it, but this is looking from the other side of the river from Virginia, but you, you can see the, uh, the all of the lumber, the uh, stacking yards, went way up toward on the Crescent Avenue. They built company houses there. There was a company store. Uh, and that building, the company store, still remains today. Which building is that? It's on, uh, well, it's on, what is the street in back of uh, Prospect Avenue? No, it's right on Prospect Avenue. It was later in Atwood and Atwood. Uh, I can't tell you what it is today, but I know it's still there. And uh, so there were the shops and mills. Hanover had at least seven mills on, on the 
on the brook, and a lot of people were going there for the uh, furniture, for the grinding of the grain, and so forth. So it was there for water power plus uh, transportation. Of, uh, That's right. Mm. The country stores were another uh, thing. They were scattered all around because the population was scattered all around. Uh, Elvin Bolster had the country store at East Rumford. Uh, and this was a type of advertising. They did. They didn't. Have, they had this type of calendar. These almanacs colorful almanac, and you notice on the reverse side it says Kimball and Elliot, and that was the store at, uh, shown here, Rumford Point. The building still stands. Uh, later, the, uh, a later picture in Rumford Point the store that uh, what came into being in 1900 about and uh, was become with Slattery and uh, uh, Irvin Cole, Fred Eames, and then my dad. There was seven for a dollar. That was a, <laughs> yes, that was a, uh, a store in Mexico, Stanley and Sons. There were these country stores all over the place. Uh, and often the post offices were in the stores. Very seldom that were they uh, at a, a separate location. The first post office was in 1815 uh, up where Earl Hutchins now lives. Nathan Adams was a postmaster. And his son, born in that house, went on, uh, got an education, went to Portland, and became the owner and advocate owner of the East and August newspaper, which was a leading main newspaper at that time. Uh, with this post office at Rumford Center for a hundred they now it's 140 years have been a post office in that village. Mount Zirkin had a post office that lasted 40 years. And in fact, at different times, there were nine different post offices in town. Of course, when the rural free delivery came in, then they closed down these and the outstanding ones. And in the early businesses, uh, of course, one of the early pharmaceutical businesses were Bridgham and Fernald. But before Bridgham, here was a picture of Bridgham and Son when they delivered their uh, prescriptions by order. And if, at the time Rumford was coming, the Rumford Falls was springing up and coming into being, uh, there was a tremendous amount of organized uh, people, organized companies becoming corporations and so forth, and you find them on file in the in the register of deeds. And I've, I've crossed off a few here. It was the Rumford Falls Brick Company, the Rumford Falls Candy Company, the Rumford Driving Association, the Rumford Novelty Company, the Rumford Fruit Company, Workman's Investment Company, Union Construction, Western Novelty, Oxford Press Stone and Concrete, Hanover Spring Company, Virginia Spring Water Company, Boston and Rumford Falls Express Company, E.J. Roderick Company, the Cam Jack Company, Wing Machinery Company, R.M. Woodson Fuel Company, Rumford Construction, Oxford County Cooperation Association, the Majestic Theater, Rumford Lithuanian Co-op, West Devon Silver and Black Fox Company, Grace Mills Company, Ellis River Telephone Company, Meadowbrook Farm Association, Mercer Cell Company, which uh, was later became part of the Oxford operation, the Rumford Woolen Company too. And then, then there was one, it's a sort of a puzzle, it was the uh, Rumford Torpedo Association. Rumford Torpedo Association. 
Well, I don't think they ever did anything, to oh. tell the truth. The, uh, it sort of, you couldn't find out much about it. It's sort of defined. It's, it, probably we should take into consideration here the men who walked in the shadow of history of this town. And they were the outstanding men. And you have to single them out. Because the first, of course, was Francis, Francis Kyes. Came here as a boy, never had a formal education, but de developed into one of the leaders of the town and uh, saw, it, it saw its um, development into a plantation, then into a, a town, became its first, uh, really, mayor, first select men. And uh, lived at, on, at Rumford Corner. There is the, um, we have here, a picture of probably the, where they lived. This, this is a picture of a, uh, a building which presumed the walkers to have lived in, but this was long after the, the, the better residence was built. And uh, Kai's, Kai's lived in that building, apparently. And then Walker after? I don't think the Walker's never lived in it, no, no. And the Kai's Monument, which is established right near there, was established in, by, the, by the Walker's in later years. But the, there's a, 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 a uh, slab. I don't know what you a call plaque, it. Yeah. There's a plaque on there that describes the whole thing. So we get into that. You can't say enough about Francis Kyes, tremendous man. And, uh, and followed by Walker, Timothy, a man by the name of Timothy Walker, who came here from Concord to uh, really to manage the family's. Uh, land interests in this town. He came here as a young man, probably around 21, 22, and he married a local girl the name of Abbott. And they built this home and lived there for a lifetime. Timothy Walker was a, uh, he have a pic photographs here of Walker and his uh, wife, I built, uh, Luna was her name. Uh, he was a leader. He served in the legislature. He served in various town offices. Uh, he was a loaner of money and did many good deeds and never, never, was, uh, never expected credit for what he did. Uh, you have to single him out by uh, just guessing who did what. And you find out Walker did it, the good deeds of that area. And uh, this, here we have a picture of his monument. The family had left a, a trust of uh, some $2,300 to the town, the interest to keep uh, the monument in the shape. This is a recent picture. We had to prop the gate up and prop the rails up. The interest on that fund comes from around $175 a year, and the town has used the money to uh, keep the cemetery up, but they haven't used it to keep the lot up. And the, the, uh, the grants of the town specified for the upkeep of the Walker lot, any excess to be used for the upkeep of the cemetery. So that's, um, and uh, Walker, and who would you, you, have, yeah, you have to say Pettengill was the third one, Waldo Pettengill. And there we have Waldo Pettengill, born 1866 in uh, Livermore Falls, came here with his parents before he married uh, in 73. He died in 1926. Giant of a man, but he, he became associated with, with uh, Chisholm and was his right-hand man. 
uh, always said that Pettengill was the right man in the right place at the right time. Walker had private interests as well as public interests. He, over the years, he, he, he first lived on the farm and inherited it from his father where Bill Weston lives now, right. known as Pine Hill Farm. Uh, then he went into other fields. He bought up other farms. Here, here is a, a, a view of him in a field of hay with his, uh, right over his head you can see his, the Walker farm which he inherited. Oh, yeah. And uh, that was uh, Broadview Farm. Then later on, he acquired uh, the Baca Farm down where Thornton's Chicken Farm is now. And that was Edge Hill Farm. And then he had another one which uh, later became the Bro's Dairy Occupation on Spruce Street, uh, upon the, yeah, Spruce, no, not so Spruce Street. Yeah, uh, yeah Spruce Street. Uh, and that was, uh, I think that was called Meadowfield. And interestingly enough, he, he, fought, he was at these farms all the time. He never missed a week going to him. They, they were tenant farmers. Okay. They were hired. Uh, and uh, he always had the college kids work on his farms during the summer months. If a kid was going to college, he wanted a job in the summer, Waldo Pettengill would put him on one of his farms. But he and himself never lived on any of these farms. Well, he lived on the one, he grew up on the one where uh, Bill Weston okay. lives. And then, of course, when he became affiliated with Chisholm, he, uh, he went to Rumford Falls, so-called, at that time, and he built this house, which exists that a day. But this was a scene from the exact spot before he built it. So you can see the change over the years. He, he, it was built in Victorian times, and he, he was a great man for photography. And, and this was a scene that he had taken from the interior of his house, which shows the decor of the homes at that particular time. We're getting up to the, the industrialization of the town here. Of course, it, it all came about when Hugh Chisholm, riding down through here in a sleigh, saw the falls and saw the possibilities. And uh, it wasn't long before he and Pettengill had gone to work acquiring the lands, and they brought in the surveying crews. And as the first survey crew, uh, of the Rumford Falls Power Company. Of course, the power company came first. And uh, it was a monumental task, and it, grew, it went fast. Uh, at the time he acquired the land, here, here, was, here was the scene of the three mills that were there. A fulling mill, a grass mill, and probably a, a sawmill by the virgins. He, he, that was one of the first things that uh, Pettengill acquired was, was that uh, territory there, the falls itself. And as it grew along into uh, different stages, he, after the, he started developing power, I presume this is the first power station at what period in time I don't know. Here, here was the second stage here, and here was a more later one, and probably up up to the time. Uh, but to drop back a little bit to show you how they they got the water before the dam was built here, how they got the water. 
the, the virgins to these mills. Here you see the, the three mills with three streams of water coming down through there. And here you see the canal at the, uh, at the head of the falls that they cut through the stone that, v that shunted the water down to these three mills. And that this thing grew and grew, and up until the, here is a photograph, show you of how fast it progressed. Uh, this is about 1905, only f only a matter of uh, a dozen or so years after the first work started. Shows the sluiceway, the railroad tracks on the on the uh, east side of the river, uh, the penstocks, the floridge, and the whole th whole thing. And here we have, from the other, looking the other way. And this is the only picture that I've ever seen of the boardwalk. There are a lot of people will remember that boardwalk. It ran past power station down over the hill uh, out into uh, in the Moss Bridge area. It's presumably built because there were no <coughs> automobiles and no transportation. People walked to work and uh, they kept it. They were keeping them out of the mud. That's a whole story. It sounds like you can see the tracks. Oh yes, that's right. Here and here, we have what where the uh, what they call the canal is now. Two scenes was an axe factory in there, run, run by this man with Bartol Perry. And uh, those are two primitive scenes there.